see. That's the box. That's okay. Hi guys. Um, so if you guys don't know, my name is Ryan. Um, what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be talking a little bit about some, uh, what I was doing this winter in Minnesota, which was dog sledding. Um, and we're going to, I'm going to show you guys some pictures and we're going to do some video, um, do some talking about the dogs and all the kinds of awesome things in winter camping and things like that. So can everybody hear me? Give me a thumbs up if everybody can hear me. Awesome. All right, so it looks like everybody's doing it, but just a reminder for everybody can keep their, uh, their microphones on mute so that way we can, uh, you guys can all hear me and the different things like that. Um, so yeah, and then if you guys have questions, when we get to that part, you can either type them in the chat or you know, raise your hand or ask the question when we get there. So first things first, um, what I did this winter was I was a tripping guide, um, land, land interpreter for dog mushing trips where I worked with scouts and teenagers from all over the country in northern Minnesota, which is all the way up by Canada. Um, let me try and I'm going to show you guys the picture of the map. So Can you guys see the picture of the map? Cool. So where the red dot is, that's where I lived all winter in uh, Ely, or just outside of Ely, Minnesota. And we camped and we lived here. And then on our dog sled adventures, we would go all the way up. We'd go out on this lake here called Moose Lake. And we would travel from lake to lake across with dog sleds all the way up to this white line up here. This is the Canadian border. So we would dog sled all the way up to Canada, and then we'd come back down, or we'd come over here, and then we'd travel through all of these lakes down to the right side of the map, and all the way back across this big one called Snowbank, and back to our base camp. And we would do that in about three or four days, traveling anywhere between uh, like seven miles in a day on dog sled and to like 15 to 20 miles a day on dog sled. Um, which is pretty, pretty cool and a lot of fun. How do I? One second. So, here we go. I want that one. All right. Ah. 
Sorry. There we go. Okay. And this one. There we go. And then, can you guys see the dog sled picture? How do I see? One second. There we go. All right. So these are the some pictures and stuff from the dog sledding adventure. Um, so each night when we got to camp, we did all of our cooking over campfire. Um, we did all of our cooking over campfire and these big kettles and pots. And so the, um, the kids and everybody, we all had to collect firewood and we had to make sure that the dogs were okay and get everything set, um, set up so that way we could have our food because without the fire and without having taken care of the dogs then we didn't get to eat because the dogs always got to eat first. So we had to make sure that we had the dogs taken care of and this is also sometimes how we would cook the dogs dinner um, which was just heating up water and heating up chunks of meat for the, and kibble for them to, to have so that way they stay nice and hydrated. I go to the next. Yeah. So this is an example of like on the right, you guys can see um, the example of the size of the dogs. That dog's name is Eddie. He's super sweet. Um, so the dogs range in size from that who, and he's uh, smaller than Nika, but it, um, some of the dogs that we have are much bigger than Nika. You, um, there are some who, when they stand up on their hind legs, are almost six feet tall. They're huge, and they're a lot of fun. Um, the picture on the left, excuse me, is a picture of a, uh, a standard sled team, which is made up of six dogs. In the front, you have your lead dogs, which are these what, this white pair here in the front. Those are your lead dogs. Those are going to be your dogs who are um, listening for directions. They're going to be a little bit smarter, maybe a little bit more experienced. They are going to be listening for the instructions about where to go and what to do. Then you have your point dogs, which are the ones in the middle. Those are the guys who are going to help with your speed and trying to keep everything going. And then in the back, you have your third row, which are called wheel dogs which are your big strong boys who are, or, and girls who are going to help with that initial tug and getting everything moving. And they're all gonna be running the whole time. Cause sled dogs don't have like multiple speeds like a car, they wanna go the whole time. So when you're on the back of a dog sled, you have to be riding and using a brake almost the whole time or else they'll get super tired very fast or more tired more quickly which we don't want to do because then they get burnt out we want to these are endurance athletes these dogs travel more miles than any other land mammal in the entire world so we want to keep them at a steady pace kind of like a jog we don't want them to go sprinting because like when you sprint you get more tired faster than when you get jog when you jog right so we want to keep them at that good pace um as you guys can see, so when we're riding around on the sleds, you have your team of six dogs, and then you have one person on the back of the sled, and then you can have one person in the basket, or the bag as it's called, which is a lot of fun. And the dogs can pull and do that just fine with two to three people on a sled. More pictures of pretty dogs. Um, as you guys can see the, on the left, there's a um, the picture has the sled in the background. That's what a sled looks like when it's got all the gear in it. It's, I know it's not a super close-up picture, um, but that it's fully loaded. It's got like sleeping mats and things like that on top. And then pretty fluffers with a pretty sunset or sunrise. Um, some of the other things that we do is we do uh, ice fishing, which is really cool. It's basically where you dig or drill a hole through the ice 
um, which can be like four inches deep or like feet deep. And you use like a giant hand drill and you can either, they make motorized ones, but you always used hand ones. Um, and they drill holes down in the ice about eight inches big. And then you put what's called a tip up, which is a kind of like fishing rod um, across the hole. And then when the fish bites the worm down in the hole, a flag goes up and then you run over like a silly person and grab the grab the, the line in the fish. On the left side of this picture, there's that fishing pole. It's kind of like a little, a regular fishing pole, except they're shorter and meant for ice fishing. Um, this is like a, like a basic ice fishing campsite. So we built a fire so that way we could cook any fish that we caught. Um, in the back, you see this red square tent. That's what's called a dark house. So you can go in there and then you can actually see down into the ice and through the ice because there's light coming through the snow and the ice around the dark house and it comes up and underneath and then you can see up from the water in the dark house. So that's my buddy Paul. You guys can see he, we were digging the ice hole when we were going fishing that day and his arm is all the way down in that hole and we still weren't as to the to the water yet. So that was like over two feet of ice that we were standing on top of and fishing through. When we go on these trips, we make what are called snow kitchens. Um, and which is pretty much what you guys can see here is we make a big pile of snow. And then because snow is a really great like crafting material for structures and things like that, you make your big pile, you let it sit for a little bit so the snow can all rest and compact. And then you carve out the different shapes. So as you can see here, we built a nice big counter. We have our tool storage over on the side. All of our water bottles are down in these holes. And the reason we put the water inside of the snow is because snow actually insulates. And so we put hot water or water in there. And because the snow is so tightly packed, it stops that heat from escaping and it helps keep your other things warmer longer. Eventually they will get cold, but it not as quickly as otherwise. Um, here's another much larger kitchen that's got benches on the sides. This is like a very, very fancy one and big one that we built. Um, and then in the middle, you have your cooking area with some big benches. Once again, your water bottle holders, trash cans, very important because we don't want to be even any trash anywhere uh, on these really nice lakes. And all of these campsites are all out on frozen lakes. And I think that's it for pictures. So does anybody have any questions about dog sledding or anything like that? Yeah, Mason. Do you have any type of dogs like Buck? What's who's Buck? The dog from Call of the Wild. Ah, um, so our dogs don't look necessarily like him, but we have um at the at the kennel that I partner with because we the program that I work with has, works with two different dog kennels. All of our dogs are what are called Alaskan Huskies, which can look anywhere from like Buck in that movie to something kind of like Nika or what you would consider like a normal big fluffy husky to be because during the, the gold rush in like the 1800 or 1900, but during um, the gold rush, when everybody was trying to go to Alaska and find gold and things like that, they were trying to figure out what animals would be really good for moving long distances without taking a lot of fuel um, because the horses were getting sick or they were um, hurting themselves um, on the on the inclines and then they discovered that dogs could get, work a lot with a little bit of food so sled dogs became the main way of transporting and so they took a bunch of the stray animals from all across the country sent them up to Alaska and then with the um, Inuit dogs and the Alaskan Malamutes which were already the dogs of the mountains they bred them together to what is considered today to be an Alaskan Husky. And they are, 
Um, they are basically a mix of a whole bunch of different um, uh, breeds. So they're super healthy. They don't get sick. They don't, or not as sick. They can run almost every day for their entire lives, miles and miles and miles, and not have to worry about getting super tired or getting exhausted. And because through their, their breeding program, they have just become healthier and healthier and healthier. Does that answer your question, Mason? I haven't seen the movie, so I know, I don't, I kind of know, I, I've read the book, so I've seen what it looks like in the picture, mm -hmm. like the one picture of Buck in the book, but that's all I saw, I've seen. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I have not read the book either, so I don't know what he looks like, but he's, if you look up just like Alaskan Huskies, you'll see some variation, you'll see some that look like the a husky and then you'll see some that look almost like nika or like a german shepherd or a, um i've seen ones that i thought was like oh that's a black lab but no it was an alaskan husky it just has that genetic dimorphism that changes the way they look um who you have a question about yep. where do they stay yep so um during like when we're not on our trips the dogs stay at the kennel which is kind of like um imagine like the main field at camp but with 115 dog houses in it and so they all have their own dog house they have what's called a stakeout post in front of their dog house and then they have like six feet around that is their space and so they're um, connected to their stakeout posts but that's perfect for them they can still interact with the dogs around them and hang out and be social with each other, but it also allows them to have their own space. And then when we're out on, um, when we're out on trail, like out on our trips, we have what's called a stakeout line, which has like 12, uh, almost like little leashes that are about two feet long coming off of it. And it's like a 20, 30 foot section of uh, cable. And then the dogs all get attached to that together um, out while we're out on trail. And then some of the dogs, are what are called trustworthy dogs and they get to hang out in camp with us and not have to necessarily be put on the stakeout line because we don't have to worry about them like leaving the campsite because they want they know where they're getting fed who the, who's like in charge and they want to be with the people um camp asked how much weight can the dogs pull an average sled dog can pull somewhere between two to three times their own body weight so somewhere between 100 and 200 pounds per sled dog, which um, you can get a, a fully loaded sled somewhere between 700 and 1,000 pounds. And that's like maximum load most people don't, or most sleds and dogs don't um, want to pull nearly that much, but that's the like the recommended absolute max. Yeah, Jude, go ahead. Um, go ahead. Question. Wait, what was I going to ask? He's going to come back. Come Say we'll come back. We'll come back once we think of our question. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions? Excuse me. Um, what are some, so some of the other things that we did, how do they train the dogs? So dogs are really cool and they have like a collective memory and a social memory. So when they get a new puppy or a younger dog who is learning how to be a sled dog or is what they call a yearling and starting to be more active at the kennel and things like that, they put that dog next to a more experienced dog and then pretty much it's that older dog's responsibility and job to help guide and teach that younger dog that's next to it how to do its job. So if they're in the back, it's, all right, we're gonna have to pull and then helping keep those younger dogs in line as well. Because if they wanna go, if they're supposed to be all be going to the left, which is called ha in, um, in mushing, then you're gonna, then 
those older dogs are going to want to go left, but say the younger dog wants to go to the right, that older dog is going to be like, nope, we're going to go this way and help pull them the, the correct way. Um, Jude, you remember what your question is? What were the types of dogs that they took out of the wild? That they took out of the wild, like to in Alaska? So in Alaska, there were what are called Inuit dogs, which are like the, um, one of the closest genetic relatives to wolves that are domesticated by people. Um, and domesticated is used very lightly. Um, they're very big, strong dogs, but they don't move very fast. And then the, but they can still go just as far. And then the um, Alaskan Malamute, which is more of a mountain dog that's meant for, it's once again, very big, very strong, and is, excuse me, going up mountains and things like that. And then they had the Sub Siberian Huskies from Russia and Siberia, who then got transplanted to Alaska. And then pretty much all of the strays went up. And then when those different species or subspecies of dogs bred, we have Alaskan Huskies. Um, so when you're on the back of a dog sled, there are different instructions that you can give to the dogs or rather suggestions because they have their own minds. We, the only thing we can really do is make a request and hope and reinforce that they follow that request. Because if they want to go to the right and they all want to go to the right, which means going home, and they really want to go home, there's not a whole lot you can do to stop them except ride on your brake. So in order to tell them where we want them to go or how to start or how to stop, we have different commands. So our starting command was ready, all right, which is basically getting the dog's attention. You go ready. And then they, if they're lying down and things like that, they all stand up, look around, get ready to pull. And then you go all right. And then they all tug forward. And sometimes you push the sled. And then that's how you start. Um, if you want to go to the left, you're going to say ha. Um, and if you want, which is H-A-W, ha. And then if you want to go to the right, you're going to say G, which is G-E-E, -E, I think. Um, but so, and then if you want to go keep going past another person or past a turn or something like that, you're going to say on by. So together there's H, which is ha. There's O, which is on by, and then there's G, which is G. But together, to remember your commands, it's hog, or that you can remember that in the word right, that there is a G for G and ha. Rory, you have a question? Uh, how did the ice not break? How did the ice not break? That's a good question. So at the beginning of the winter, when it gets cold, the because it's lake, so the water's not moving very much. So there it gets a thin layer of ice, and then it gets cold again, and then it freezes more, and the ice over time, the ice gets thicker and thicker. So for like the first couple weeks that I was there, the ice was too thin. So we weren't allowed to go on the ice. Um, and so to help because like once the ice gets about four inches thick, then you um, can put somewhere between, I think 600 and 800 pounds, like in one spot, that's the ice is, gets super strong. At something like a foot thick, you can put over a thousand pounds in like one spot and not have to worry about it. But over time, the ice just gets thicker and thicker as it gets colder and the water freezes under top and um, underneath and on top and the snow helps keep that ice there during the winter as well. But sometimes the water doesn't freeze. What did we sleep in on the trip? We slept in um, what are called, uh, what we called sleep systems, which is a giant sleeping bag that fits an, another sleeping bag inside of it. So you're using two sleeping bags and two sleeping mats, which are like foam pads that you put on the ground. 
and you put your foam pads down and then you put your big sleeping bags on top, one inside of the other, and then that's what you crawl down into. Um, and then that's how you stay nice and warm. And that system, uh, the system that we use is rated down to like negative 40 degrees, which is very, very cold. Negative 40 degrees is the same temperature in Fahrenheit as it is Celsius, which is a fun little fact. Yeah, Jude. Um, what if you're sleeping one night and then when you wake up? Wait, what if you're sleeping and then and, and in the morning, morning, you sleep in and it gets warm and the ice beneath you melts and you fall into the bed? So that's a really um, interesting thing. So with your body heat, you it cannot melt through the ice and also with fire. So when we built our fires for cooking, we would put two logs down to stop the um, the the fire pan what we were building our fires on from sinking into the ice we put two sticks down and then from the heat of our fire there would become a like a, a a dish in the ice but because of the temperature of the ice and the temperature of the water below the fire even if you make a giant one you cannot melt all the way through the ice because the fire would put itself out or you would get too wet and you'd wake up if you were doing it with like body heat your body doesn't get hot enough to melt through the ice. You can like heat up the ice to make an imprint, which I have done many times. Um, I'll pull away my sleeping mats and you can tell exactly where I was sleeping because there's little ridges in the ice, but you, they're not enough to where you would melt through the ice. Um, somebody asked, how much does the average dog weigh? That's a really good question because it could be anywhere from they can be like 40 pounds to upwards of 85 to 90 pounds big dog big sled dogs are 85 to 90 pounds the little ones are little and way less around 30 to 40 pounds um oh so rory was also asking about the ice earlier so the ice does this really cool thing especially when there's big temperature shifts, like in a single day, if there's a 20 or 30 degree temperature swing, um, the ice will crack and it will shift. But because they're on lakes and you're moving across the lakes, you don't have to actually worry about it cracking because the ice has nowhere to go. So if the ice is here and it's together and it's one piece and it cracks and it goes crack like this, there's nowhere for that because the ice, when it cracks, it wants to move outward. There's nowhere for that ice to go because it's on a lake. So it's completely surrounded by land. So it may crack a little bit, but the ice isn't going to shift or slip underneath of each other. Unlike on like the ocean or things like that, where that can happen because the water's moving so much. Any last questions? Yeah, Mason. It's not really a question. It's, pr it's kind of like a comment. Um, All right. I know you shouldn't um, sled on rivers. That's, you shouldn't do that unless, unless the ice is a decent foot thick. Right, so the thicker the ice, the better your traveling conditions are gonna be. Um, sometimes that it may be your only option, but you always wanna be checking your ice before you move to a new, um, a new section where you don't know what the conditions are like. Kind of like um, checking out a campsite before you go there um, in the summertime or things like that. Making sure that all of you, your safety components are met first before you travel. Uh, yes, Myers family. Um, how old? Do the dogs need to be to be able to hold uh, the people? Um, so dogs start learning to pull sleds um, just when they're just under a year old, um, sometimes a year to a year and a half. And then the oldest dogs that I know that still pull and um, still are active dog sled are 17. 
and they don't run nearly as far as the younger dogs who can do 20, maybe 30 plus miles in a day, where the older dogs maybe do more like four to eight miles in a day, um, where they're not going as far because their bodies just can't take it, but they still love to run. They still want to be out there doing it every day because they love what they get to do so yes. much. Jude, you had a question still? What if the ice cracks and then it gets cold and then where that ice cracks, more ice tries to push up from that crack and that ice wants to get bigger and it pushes those pieces of ice onto that. So that's kind of how it works. So if there is a crack that forms, there's not going to be a new piece of ice that comes up, but there can be water that's going to come up potentially a little bit, not a lot, but that water is going to come up that crack and then it's going to refreeze in that crack the next time that it gets cold. So that way, and then it just makes that, that same spot just as strong without having like, it doesn't push the ice further apart. Can I also say another thing that why you shouldn't try, while you, 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 sh you can travel on rivers, but you shouldn't. Let's see what you got, Mason. Because even though the top's frozen, there's the water's underneath it is still moving. Absolutely. That's uh, right. So, so if you fall on, you're like, you're under the ice. Right. So if there's a current, underneath the ice and something happens and you go through, that's gonna wanna pull you underneath, which is why if you do fall through the ice or start to go sink in or sink into slush or anything, you wanna kind of belly flop down onto the snow or the ice, spread your weight out. So that way it's, you're not putting all your pressure in one spot. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, any last questions? Uh, Rory, you got one more? And then Rory, then Christopher. Um, but what if ice cracks were, but if, I forgot. Oh, yeah. Uh, you want to ask your question, Christopher? Maybe Roy will remember later. Do you know what you what we are doing tomorrow? Tomorrow is horse care with Casey. All right, Mason, last one. How much do you think they drink in a day? The dogs? So the dogs, in their breakfast, they get... um they get a, a bowl of, of what we call cereal, which is a mix of either b beef or mink meat and um, dog kibble mixed with like lukewarm water. And then, so they drink that and they get about a liter of water in that. And then they eat snow and other things throughout the day. And then they get that same amount with a little bit more water for dinner. So they get o just over a liter of water in the morning and get almost a liter and a half in the evening time um, as part of their dinner. And then sometimes they get like a, uh, extra fatty snacks during the day or things like that. But the dogs, just like how you hear that you're supposed to wait after you eat to go to the pool, you're supposed to um, wait so that way the dogs don't get sick because they'll throw up and things like that while they're running. <coughs> All right, you guys, thanks for hanging out and listening to and asking great questions about dogs. Um, if you guys have any other questions, you guys can let Camp know and I can try and answer them and message you guys back. Um, can't wait to see you guys this summer, hopefully. And hopefully we'll do another Zoom soon. Bye guys.